Welcome to the STEM Professional Chats by iSTEM Care. The purpose of this podcast is to bring career stories from STEM professionals, which is primarily people from science, technology, engineering, and mathematics background, uh, who undertook a non-traditional career paths. And we hope that this career journey uh, roadmap discussion with the STEM professionals from STEM community will be helpful for you especially students and early career professional to craft your own career journey in future. So today, uh, I am Dr. Pawan and I'm joining with my colleague, Dr. Mansi. And our guest for today is very special. Uh, he is Dr. Uh, Parag Mahanti. Uh, Dr. Paraz, Parag is a PhD in chemistry and, and chemical biology and founder of GradGrid and currently works as a, uh, at Novartis as Director of Investors Relation. He'll be uh, sharing his journey from back India to US to further his involvement in STEM uh, to the management to consulting uh, and, and a lot of ventures who, what he has been working. So welcome Dr. Parag uh, for today's virtual studio. We are very happy to have you. Hey everyone, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So the first question uh, uh, we would start kind of discussing, not a question, but more of a discussion. So we would be like, would want to understand your specific opportunities and challenges throughout your career journey from your early education to the, to the no artists. And you, you can take kind of a uh, sufficient amount of time to give us a whole background. And from there, we build our discussion. Absolutely. So, uh, so I come from Calcutta, right? And my parents are Bengali, I'm Bengali. And so, as you can imagine, and if you don't know, I'll tell you that Bengali parents essentially believe that, you know, engineering and medicine is pretty much, you need, that's your goal in life. If you didn't get in through an engineering college or a medicine college, then eh, it's okay, you're second class, but like, okay, fine, you can do science, right? But pretty much that's the that's the tier, right? So most people, when I was growing up, were following science. And so I, I did have a rank in, in the West Bengal joint, but my dad was a chemistry student. My, my uncle is a chemistry PhD. His wife is a chemistry PhD. And so pretty much it was like, yeah, I'm going to study chemistry. Like my brother started studying chemistry as well uh, in his undergrad. And so I wanted to study chemistry just because there was nothing else around me at that time. But also I was super interested in like chemical reactions, right? So just because there was everybody talking about it in, my, in, in and around me, I was like, okay, this is interesting. And then, of course, somebody put the idea in mind that, you know, chemistry is also the basis of, you know, a lot of biochemical reactions. And so I was like, okay, then understanding life is super important and chemistry might lead me, right? So there was some amount of that. But the other thing also that was going through in my mind was that my dad would always say that you haven't, like he, when he was growing up, you know, in his time, which is right after independence and uh, India is still figuring out their education systems and everything, he had the opportunity to live in a hostel. Now, I, I call it an opportunity because that's what he said, but he would also say, you know, how like, you know, how that was uh, a tremendous experience, but also, you know, marred with things. But he always used to harp on that when I was growing up, that go and live in a hostel, stay outside home. And that's very diff different from most Bengali parents, by the way, right? Most Bengali parents don't necessarily want their like, kids to leave home. Uh, but for me, that was the case. And so when I had the option to study uh, after my under for my undergrad, I actually applied to a bunch of, I mean, other than the engineering colleges, the only place that I applied to was in Delhi at St. Stephen's. And that was because my uncle who lived in Delhi said that this is a college, you know, uh, it's a great college. I don't know if you'll get through but uh, you can try, right? So, so I was like, what? I can't get through. Let me try. So, so that's how I, 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 and when I got through Stevens, I was like, yay, that's awesome. The one, one little side thing that I will say, I actually wanted to study literature, right? Just as a side note, I didn't want to study. I mean, chemistry was great. Chemistry was always going to be my subject, but I was like, I also, I'm good at uh, writing and I want to study literature. So on my train back in the Rajdhani with my dad, after knowing that I've gotten through chemistry honors at St. Stephen's, I was like, okay, so should I still apply for Presidency College in Chemistry? And should I still apply for English in Jadapur, which is uh, 
which is in in, in Cal- Calcutta and my dad looked at me and he's like what are you crazy <laughs> no just you've caught it in, go do that so so that's the second stage so now i'm in st stevens in delhi a uh, great college amazing culture of like you know i i, I cannot say enough about we were taught to ask and it was just a mixture of a whole bunch of really smart people that uh, just you know we were challenging each other all the time there was of course i mean there's for everything there's always bad and good and there was always some politics here and there some you know random things going on but it was truly uh, for me at least who has only lived in calcutta for his entire high school years it was for me like a suddenly oh my god i now know a bunch of people from all these different parts of india and i i want to say one very quick thing right it's it's important to say it especially in today's uh, situation in india i'm a bengali uh hindu by birth but i'm not practicing religion like i'm not religious uh i went to st thomas's which is a catholic school in a part of calcutta that is primarily muslim right and so i had growing up i had this like very weird you know uh, people nowadays i don't know why but people nowadays question the word secular but i had a very interesting dynamic of growing up right while in calcutta and so that even further increased while i was in delhi cuz stevens again i mean it's a so called christian college but it had a people from everywhere and i i today when i look back and people ask me questions about that i'm like wow that was very important so i just wanted to highlight that that is that is something very important and people who are going through right now through their colleges right now and through their university education recognize that recognize that uh that hybridization of culture and that feeling that you know you can learn from other people because it is super important in today's days and time both in the US and in India to understand how these things mix and match right all right so that being said now i'm studying chemistry in stevens l- meet a bunch of people who are kind of you know telling me more about what can be done and then of course the idea of studying in the us comes up right also my elder brother at that time was working for a tech company uh, cuz he had left chemistry joined engineering so he's in the us and he's saying yeah take the gre gre is good and so i was like okay uh what is this gre and so people started explaining to me i was like oh my god this sounds too complicated so for the first two years didn't think about gre didn't even study really much in, in undergrad <laughs> first two years was not not good uh scores uh and for those who are sitting outside the u in india and have not grown up in the indian system remember that scores in the indian system is super important <laughs> so that's why i mentioned that um it's like gpa but even more uh and so third year i right, realized but for us every semester's gpa counts and not for the not for you know not the not the cumulative university but for the community <laughs> <laughs> yeah even at college people are going to ask your parents how did you, how did how is your son doing in college <laughs> so uh so third year of college uh people are applying for iits i also sit for the jam and i didn't get a good rank so i didn't make it to any of the iits i try for um hyderabad university which was really big in chemistry i try for indian institute of science get interviews at both of those places but couldn't convert the interviews for my masters education in neither of those places so now i'm like okay delhi university and i don't get selected in the first list of delhi university right so so now i don't have a university and my dad is like well you can always try calcutta university and i'm like really like that's the situation right now so finally somehow i did manage to make it to delhi university chemistry masters and uh i i chose organic organic as my specialization and then i kept studying masters but then i started preparing for the gre and that's when i realized oh it's uh it's just english and math and uh why not you know let's just and it was uh it's grueling for anybody who is starting to prepare it's extremely grueling i understand but just do your time uh write you know these little things you know those uh, flash cards i used to in i used to carry the way the way i used to do is i used to have these pieces of paper and i used to fold them four times like 1 2 3 4 like it will become super thin 
and on one one of those edges would be the word and on the other the synonym and then in, in another one the word and the antonym right because that's what you would remember to to, to for GRE, I don't know if any of you. Oh God, Parag, this is bringing lots of flashbacks that I don't want to relive. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I don't even know. You asked me a simple question. I don't even know how I got here, right? So I'll quickly finish. But I used to carry those in Delhi Metro, and like I would, I would keep reading them. So long story short, GRE was actually good. I, I did have a good score. Uh, subject GRE was okay. I did. I had an average score, but altogether, it was enough for me to get through a really good university in the US, which was Cornell. And uh, funny story there, I thought, yay, Cornell never really understood much about where it was. And it said Cornell University, New York. And so I was like, oh, it's in New York. Um, and so I, and, and by the way, Cornell's India Association is really good. And the chemistry department also is really good. So they send you a letter saying what you need to do to get to Cornell from the airport. So I'm like, oh, I have the letter, but I haven't really read it, right? So I get off the airport and then I start reading and there's like, okay, so take this bus. So I take the bus and then it takes me to this place called Port Authority, which for everybody else is a bus station. And I'm like, it's like, uh, you know, any of the bus stations in Delhi, if you think about it, that's the only thing I know for Delhi. Um, so I go there and then like, okay, so take this number bus, go to this floor and take this bus. And I go there and I'm like, all right, take take this bus because by the way port authority is in the middle of new york city right and i'm thinking oh this is new york and then i get on the bus and the bus keeps moving and then after two hours i'm like where am i going because it's a five hour bus ride and cordial is middle of nowhere in a gao in a village called itaka far away from new york city and then i realize oh my god on a hill on a hill <laughs> It's beautiful. It's beautiful when I reached, which was July. Yeah. But it was it was not New York City. And I come from Calcutta. I come from Delhi. I'm an extrovert. So five years of PhD was was brutal for me. Um, I, other than a PhD, the one big thing that I did take away from my five years, though, is that I met my wife there. So that was good. Um, but other than that, uh, PhD was great. I worked at a really productive lab. Uh, had a bunch of papers, many of them really good papers, but around third year of my PhD, I realized I don't want to do science in the bench. I think I love the science. I love working around it, but I don't necessarily need to work on the bench. That, that was my, but now the question was, all right, so I love science. I love thinking. I love anal analytical thinking. I know that I'm smart in that way, but how do I, what do I do? And so that's when I started uh, talking to people. And so this will come back as with other questions, uh, with other discussions that we go. But the one thing that I will continue telling people over and over again, don't stop talking to people. One of the things that I did just because I was extrovert and if I didn't do it, I wouldn't get energy in life. But I'm asking all of you and many of you might be introverts. Uh, don't stop talking to people because that the biggest the worst mistake that you can do is to think that you know everything because we don't we know everything about this one subject that is your thesis and other than that we pretty much don't know anything unless we talk to people and so i talk, i spoke to a whole bunch of people and some of them were very good friends and they basically said look you like talking you like meeting people you like working in teams and you like solving problems so consulting might be a good idea and i'm glad that i got that advice and so that's when I started thinking, okay, how, how do I get into a consulting job? Um, we can get into what consulting is uh, at a separate point. I don't want to get in there, but there are steps that I took. I joined the consulting club at Cornell. I joined the finance club at Cornell. Um, and those clubs exist in most universities. In India, if you're, if you're in India, and if you think what are those things, start the club. Start the graduate club and say, hey, this is a discussion. I mean, this is a club that we have created for people who are interested in consulting. And you will see people join it and you will, and it will happen. And I will help if you have questions, contact me, I can help. Um, and so I did that and through that, I've, I've got a few interviews, got my first job in a life sciences consulting firm. And very quickly, what they did is basically provided strategic consulting or strategic advice 
to life sciences firms. And life science means pharma, biotech, medical devices, any of, of all of those industries. And uh, while my science knowledge was very deeply involved in it, it was not scientific, but I was still working to help and support pharma companies, right? So that was happening. And after that, I did that for two and a half years. I got an inbound recruiter uh, request saying, hey, are you interested in equity research? So equity research, very briefly, is research about stocks. Uh, specifically, the kind of stocks that I was researching was biotech stocks. So companies that are involved in biotech, that's those are the companies that I was following. And so when, when I say research, what it means is that these companies would let's say, um, present data publicly, right? Anytime a phase one data or a phase two data, and for those who are new to phase one and phase two, any clinical trials that you carry out, the first phase is called phase one, then phase two, and only after a phase three that you get approved a drug. So all of these data needs to be uh, revealed to the public. But a lot of times when company will reveal this data, they, they might just reveal the data, but people don't understand. And especially many investors may not properly understand what the science is behind the data and whether what what does it truly mean because a lot of times you might get a lot of good efficacy meaning let's say it's an oncology drug or a cancer drug and uh, the data suggests that you know 55 percent people lived longer than six months without any cancer right but what was the side effects associated with that if the side effects are really bad then is that 55% really good, right? So all of that analysis, uh, investor, many investors do it already, but then there are these research groups in many of the investment banks that do that in parallel and try to support that investment strategy. And so that's what I joined. And I did that for two and a half years. Uh, around uh, 2017, uh, I, I faced a, a personal tragedy, which was when I realized I need to figure out uh, my work-life balance because both consulting and finance requires at, at an average 14 to 16 hours a day on an average, right? Maybe more. Um, and so I, I needed to kind of come to a point where I was like, you know, I need to spend more time at home. And so that's when I started looking for uh, my next position. And I was glad to get a position at Novartis. Uh, Novartis, for those who don't know, is a pharmaceutical company, an international pharmaceutical company uh, that also does uh, very cool biotech research. And so I've had a couple of positions at Novartis before, and currently I am in the investor relations team, which is basically, very simply put, uh, it is talking to the investors who are interested in the healthcare industry in the U.S. and talking to them about the company and explaining to them uh, about the products, about what's going to happen and things like that. So that's what I do in very simple terms. Um, all right. So that was a very long introduction of what I've done and how I've reached where I am. But I'll stop now. That's a very interesting journey full of detours for people who are you know <laughs> especially who are uh, sort of following this bachelor's master's or b-tech m-tech then phd then postdoc then what next that phase of life uh, you i feel like you're a <laughs> tremendous risk taker <laughs> you may not you may not acknowledge that but you know it's not easy to carve out paths in all these completely unknown professionals professions for stem background people right so my question is you didn't have any finance formal training you didn't have any formal training in consulting or you know so how did your previous internships or talking to other people networking all those things helped you to where you are right now yeah um thank you for the kind words and uh the question is, um, it's super interesting, right? And I don't have a straight answer for this. The reason why I don't have a straight answer for this is because uh, I think we have to take a step back and understand a few things that people don't realize. Um, many of these jobs, we don't understand that we already have the capability to do, 
right so that's number one so let's keep that that a lot of times we don't understand that we can do these jobs one number two i came from uh, one thing that i missed in this whole journey story is a very important quote uh, that somebody told me while i was doing my phd and i actually forget the person uh, and such a shame because it has become a very important quote in my life which is don't do something because that's the only thing you can do and uh, it just hit me very importantly that like most people go into postdocs because they think that is the only thing that is the, lo- the logical step every friend around me at cornell in chemistry these are all super smart people right amazing pedigree all of them from some iit or isc at a very big university at cornell and when i ask them about careers after their phd i can i can i remember those conversations because all of them said i don't know or a post doc or the few companies that hired directly at cornell was intel intel used to directly hire chemistry phd's and some people said pharma but they didn't know what it meant because most people didn't realize what 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 kind of job they would get and that was it that was all the chances that there were and i was like really like that is it and none of them seemed interesting to me <laughs> right but so, do you think this limited kind of vision even at the prestigious university like cornell is a result of how we approach our grad school and like you know we just get bogged down by our own topic own you know certain expertise and not really looking beyond that Oh, Mansi, you are asking tough questions. Uh, no, it's an amazing question. So, let me answer this one first, and then we'll go back to your previous question, right? Why is this? Uh, it's a mixture of reasons. Number one is exactly what you said. Uh, it's it's lack of knowledge, or let me rephrase. Wrong statement. Lack of information. Information is not knowledge. Knowledge only comes once you have the information. so most people don't understand no no right so then you start asking okay why is there a lack of information uh one part of it if you break it down into internal and external motivations i don't know something because i never tried to know number one i also don't know something because nobody told me number two right so lack of information caused by my lack of curiosity and people's lack of understanding that i might need this information so let's double click on who these people are right it's people that you are studying with so your colleagues your peers people that you're learning from so your professors the universities and then everybody around right so the whole phd system and now it's changing i shouldn't say that it's but now slowly like this conversation has happened right this such podcasts didn't exist too many there were a few there were a few but not many and uh, so people don't understand what information you need career services back at that time were only telling people how to write resumes and cover letters which is all important but nobody was really saying hey phd's can also do these things and i think that's super important to understand that 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 uh so that's the reason right that's why people don't understand mainly because they don't have the information right and they don't have the information because they never figured it out or nobody told them there is this other small part though which is why people don't know and i will have to hit upon this because i feel very strongly about this phd's many phd's and professors are arrogant they are arrogant to the point that they think they don't need to be told anything or they know everything and i'm telling you especially if there are professors who have just become professors assistant professors who are my peers i tell them all my friends i tell them they're bored with me about hearing this from me but if you are just becoming a professor remember all the things that you went through from your professors and many of them didn't realize that you needed the help try to change that try try to move away from that because unless there is an impact from the administration the institution this thing is not going to change right and so people are arrogant 
many people think oh i don't need to i don't need to network i don't need to know people i'm good enough and my research will show most people think that my research will be so good that companies will come and say hey you know we really need you it will never happen even if you are that good maybe two people three people who publish extremely well and in situations where companies take note of that publications and patterns emerge companies will go up to you and say hey please come work for us it does happen but that's three out of a million right like that's not i mean you have six i mean anyway i'm going to go into covid analogies and i don't want to <laughs> but but i i i get your point like um getting exposed to something other than research should be as important as getting your phd and you know getting the expertise that you need to get the degree but yeah coming back to our original question yeah. like so how-, how yeah so when i first had these questions then i was like okay who do i talk to first thing that i did is i spoke to people outside of chemistry right that's the first step speak to people outside of chemistry the other thing that i will say so i'll break it down into two things so i didn't do my uh, i did my masters in india but after that i came to the us so for those who are currently in phd's in india i may not be super helpful but i will say this uh t- make a linkedin profile get a good good photograph and reach out right that's why we can talk about grad grid but that's why grad grid exists that's why many other sim- similar groups exist where you can just because of social media through twitter and through linkedin you can reach out to people outside your country and talk about their experiences and what you can do so that's one within the us i can tell you very very uh, frankly around third year i realized man i'm studying in a very good university and i have not taken a course outside of chemistry and i could take any courses and people and by that time i was realizing other people who had left university and they were like i don't have access to the library i don't you know i feel i regret that i have never taken a course and i was like i don't want to be in that regret so i started taking random courses right and one of those courses was entrepreneurship it didn't really help me in a lot of ways but it did was like okay i met a whole bunch of new people that's the way that you start meeting people then ask them how are they thinking about their careers you know you will never know what you might learn and that's i go back to my point of arrogance uh i kind of i i i use the word curious i was always super curious and i was never um i don't know if i've changed a little bit now i hope not but i i was i i feel proud nowadays a little bit about m- myself back in uh, phd that i always felt i didn't know stuff and if i didn't know stuff i had to ask and ask people and they will tell me come teach me i don't know this tell me how you are doing so i met a bunch of people from biomedical engineering who were all into consulting and they were like oh they are preparing for mckinsey and bcg and i was like wait i've heard those companies now i want to know what are you doing and that's how i get got into consulting and that's how i got into consulting clubs and then people i met a bunch of people who said oh you need an mba and then i was like I don't want to do an MBA right now. So what else can I do? And so when I started asking that question, people said, "Well, then you can do consulting because consulting is a good substitute for MBA. It teaches you the same skills, but doesn't necessarily you don't have to, you know, get the degree." And I completely agree now. Right nowadays, everything that I've learned in terms of, you know, making a presentation, understanding a subject, understanding a market, all comes from consulting, right? So I think that's how those conversations helped. Asking people uh why are they doing what they're doing or why are they thinking what they're doing and taking yourself to a learner level that that I just want to learn just tell me and then working on it, right? So those are the ways that you kind of figure out what you want to do. And at the end of the day nobody's asking you, nobody's forcing you to do anything, right? As long as you are not for being forced by somebody remember that also sometimes happens i have heard where professors say i really think you will be a great postdoc right that's a good comment but it's a trap <laughs> unless you want to be a postdoc don't be- become a postdoc right explore all the options exhaust all the options if you are questioning what are the options you know there are blogs out there send me a email ask people around i'm sure mansi and pavan knows enough people who will put you in touch but 
ask people without answering the question what are the options don't think don't come to the conclusion this is my only option you know all right yeah i mean i agree i just wanted to touch base a little about arrogance versus uh inferiority complex of uh, or i would say hard mentality uh, so for example if you are surrounded by a group of people phd's a person i mean i feel sometimes that phd has no value because we don't realize what we have in hand just like you said formal or places we work right and i think most of people don't realize what is the value of phd till the time they go and talk to a non phd person a non <laughs> non background of that background person and that's where i i like your point of networking uh and, and and you know going and asking people let let our fear get exposed let yeah. ourselves get exposed that yes. i don't know yes it's so true <laughs> that exposure is so important because it's like uh, the uh, one example that i will say it's like uh if any of i'm sure you guys have had but you know whoever is listening uh if you have ever taken a a bath in like a pond or a talao or you know in bengali we say pukur uh when you hit it right if depending on where you are though like during summer the top surface water is super hot so when you actually jump it's actually super warm so then you have to actually figure out the water inside and that's different but when you hit even when you take a shower something as simple as that right when the first drops of shower hits you it's super cold and you feel oh my god what is this but then you get acclimatized with it so that exposure of getting suddenly getting exposed to a bunch of you know hot like super cold or super hot water hitting you wakes you up and and slowly you will get acclimatized and so this is in turn with mansi's question of taking risk yeah it was a lot of risk i i now i can now say that i've changed career three times not not jobs but careers and uh, it has made me extremely strong right like it has i now uh, have a very interesting set of experiences and uh uh um professional experiences that can that can i can mix and match in different situations yeah, so yeah that's true at that at that time i was like okay is this a good idea but now when i look back at it uh i will not i mean the other thing i was very quickly say right like, i hated when people said success stories right so i have to tell you the consulting job that i got was the fourth job i had i had gotten to the final rounds of three other big consulting firms and missed it and they were bad failures the equity research that i got was after some really bad interviews there was one interview where a really big analyst spoke to me and said you know what you should really find out more about what stocks are <laughs> right so so i i absolutely do want to stress on this uh failures are super important and whenever you see somebody you know uh, ask me about failure and i can have another 2 hour conversation on this like there is nothing has been easy and simple uh in that career journey but now if i look back it will sound so clear you are normalizing failures because we as a, as a phd scientist another quality that we have is to hide all the failures and all yeah. the, you know show those successful things which is weird because which everything weird. Exactly. everything we do in phd is failures right yeah, yes, because 99% of the times what we are doing is is negative experiments down, yeah. yeah negative yeah. data Because, but then because there is no to advertising yourself you only project just the good parts and you never 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 you know emphasize yeah. how long it took you to actually get to the good part and there were um struggles along the way but extreme struggles anyway exactly. sorry go ahead no but i mean just building on this discussion when you were switching careers there must be some points where you know you felt like you didn't belong oh, and yes. then how did you overcome that feeling and like did the the value system in which you grew up the exposure early on versus in the united states did all these factors also help oh yes amazing question you're you're basically asking about imposter syndrome right um and uh yes 
there is no there is no i mean there is always a long answer short answer yes absolutely at every point of time i felt like an imposter right i felt like an imposter when i went to delhi and i didn't really know hindi other than bollywood and the samachar and that's the that's how i little I, and you know bengali speak really great hindi right so i had to figure out hindi and nowadays i speak decent right i still have gender issues because like you know you know karta karti and all that i don't understand that specific gender why an inanimate object being gendered i ha- don't understand okay such a bengali to- problem <laughs> <laughs> yeah because i mean i'm we can i don't know if you want to keep this in the actual interview but bengali is such evolved language we have removed gender so think about that okay anyway um uh imposter syndrome there i was like culture shock right i did not know i came from a quite a i wouldn't say conservative i think my parents were very liberal in many sense but was in a protected environment right and i was i went to a boy school by the way right so now i go into a co-ed environment so very different and co-ed environment in delhi so like without getting into details like calcutta and delhi are in two different social structures right um so that was interesting and then i was like do i really fit in and then i had my own friends within chemistry and then my i had friends who were bengalis and then i had a whole bunch of friends who were neither and that normalized it like i i still and i'm glad that it did i'm glad that i seeked out those relationships and made friends outside of these you know these connections and that's what i'll go back to your previous question find Of course you will always find friends who speak the same language either personally or professionally meaning either they speak the actual language or they are within your subject or they are other scientists that is good but keep them all in the same bucket and then find people who are absolutely not that who don't speak the same language and are arts if you are a science student or are science students if you are an art student and try to talk to them and that expands so that happened then i came to the us delhi prepared me but not that much so suddenly now you're in the us again i have friends who are indians now and it bengali is probably prepared you for cornell weather a little bit <laughs> yeah no nothing prepares you for cornell weather for those who don't understand cornell has four months of amazingly beautiful weather which probably makes it one of the most beautiful cities in in the us and out of the other 8 months there is 6 months of snow and i'm just comparing to myself i grew up in mumbai i went to my masters in gujarat mm-hmm. and then ended up doing my phd in detroit so oh my god <laughs> prepared me for yeah. winters so nope, nothing prepares you and <laughs> detroit is one of the big lakes so it has a lot of the lake effect ithaca is uh, in beside what is known as finger lakes and so it has also a lot of effect there is snow in ithaca in may and june just fyi so between july and october are the only times that you don't see snow and then october there will start i mean maybe november ish but october it becomes chilly and from october to may there is snow and so anyway um so i co- i come to phd to the us and then i realize oh so many new people i need to meet all of them right so like that's that was my a uh, thing like okay all of these things i now need to uh figure out what they did and what they did and after a point of time in phd i realized i was sitting in lab way too much and it was good i needed to do it i was working for an assistant prof who was very ambitious and so we had long hours and so uh it is what it was and you know coming from india when somebody asks you to work hard you work hard right this is like that is it that is life aur kya karna hai right and so uh so you do that um and that prepared me that okay there are so many different people so many different experiences can i be and it made me very uh, i i nowadays when somebody asks you like why are you an ally of any of the things that is happening in the us right I also realized that there were a few things happening in India that I didn't realize at the time and now I do and so now I want to be allies about those movements as well but it was those experiences that opened my mind um and then first job after phd consulting hit with a whole bunch of information of how people perceive phd's when you see uh, you know very very easily if you do the math right 18 19 years you finish high school 
uh, 3, 4, maybe 5 years of, you know, for us, maybe bachelor's, master's, 5 years, 24, you join a PhD, 5 years average for a PhD, 29 is when you graduate, around, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it too much, maybe 27, let's call it, 27, 28, you graduate. At 28, you're graduating and you're starting your first job. There are people who have started their first job in 22. So you have to understand that yes, by age, they may be younger to you, but by experience, they are six years older than you. So then you start questioning, yeah, I'm 28, I have a PhD and I'm earning this much. This guy is 24, he's earning this much. And those questions, like you start realizing, well, you know what? PhD works separately and that curve slowly goes over like it that, that it, it, it reduces because over time people start realizing and giving importance to your PhD degree but absolutely the first job I was like man now what do I do I have a PhD but it's not really science and then I started realizing going back to myself of you know what you now really know zero. You don't have to convince yourself that you know zero. You actually don't know anything. So start learning. And that's the only way to figure it out, right? So after a point of time, and by the way, so that's not imposter syndrome. That is where you actually don't know much. But then after a point of time, you realize, you know what? Maybe you don't know this exact thing, but you know something similar. So how can you tweak that information? And that's the only advice I have for anybody suffering from imposter syndrome is Take a deep breath, take a step back and look at the stuff that is similar to the stuff that you are doing. Maybe you think that you have never done something before and that's why you don't have any experience, but you might have done something similar because, excuse me, other people believed that you could do that job. And so then find those extrapolations of how this is similar to the stuff that you're doing. And that's what I did all my life. All right, so analyzing spectra was what my PhD, like spectroscopic data. For people who don't know, spectroscopic data is just pictures about molecules. Let's just put it that way. So you understand, you look at those pictures and you find out what molecule it is. Uh, and that was, for me, was puzzle solving. When you look at consulting and you look at you know strategy consulting projects, it's puzzle solving. You basically need to figure out What are the questions? So that's my parallel. Then you come into finance where you're actually understanding a company. It's puzzle solving again. The only things that changes are parameters, right? What are the, like, how do you understand whether a product will launch in a market? The questions are slightly different, but you're still asking why, how, when, what. And then when you, and that, that was my biggest takeaway, right? So one last thing I'll say, For anybody who's ever interested in, in, in getting into projects that make you think like that, into consulting, there's a really good book by, McKinsey, uh, by an author who was previously in McKinsey called The McKinsey Mind. Uh, it's a really interesting book. It also helps you understand what a decision tree is. And uh, it's just a nice read. I, I love it. I mean, of course, I'm a nerd, but many of you who are listening are also probably nerds. So maybe you'll <laughs> like the book. But just pick a, pick a copy. You might find a copy online. Uh, it just tells you how to think. And I love that way of thinking of like breaking into different parts of why, how, what, when. And the easier it is for you to break a very complex problem into very simple parts, you pretty much can do Uh, a lot of different things. Anyway, I don't know if that answers yeah, your question. I mean, and so I have a question about the grad grid. Uh, yes. You you share with us its, its journey, its motto and its current activities about the grad grid which you run. Okay, thank you. Thank you for first. Firstly, thank you for the question. I'll send you the check separately. Uh, uh, <laughs> that was a joke, by the way, guys. I, I'm not paying power to ask that question. <laughs> Now you're on record. You have to send us a check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's fine. <laughs> But, um, all right. So very quickly, I don't have a motto yet though, uh, which is interesting. And this is something I'm thinking of is that do we have a tagline? I've started thinking enter the grid might be the tagline, but we'll see. Uh, what is grad grid? So uh, as I said, moved from my PhD to my first job in consulting. And it was a bunch of struggle. Uh, struggle in the sense of what is a resume what is a cover letter how do you interview nobody knew anything nobody really understood what jobs outside of research was 
And so then I was started questioning like, yeah, I'm not the first person getting a PhD and finding a job, right? Why is this so difficult? And so I started a blog, which was at that time called Academic Inertia. And my friends really got mad at me because like, what are you saying? What? But in my mind, it was like, you know, what is inertia? Any body that stays in a certain position without an action, action of excessive force from outside will either stay at rest or in the same continued motion. And that's exactly what I felt. I was like, unless somebody tells me from outside, I'm going to keep doing my science. I'm going to go to postdoc and then try to become an assistant professor. But anyway, at that time, that was how I felt. And while I was trying to build that, and I didn't really build that out much, I met a couple of folks from uh, New York who were uh, in the Ministry of Science, uh, from the Ministry of Science. And so with them, I started uh, supporting them in their initiatives, which back then was called CSG or Career Support Group. And so that's how I started kind of like, you know, figuring out how to how to uh, build build a, a community and i had started doing that at cornell within my blog and like sending people what do they want so i had already started having thoughts but then these guys already had an iisc alumni group and so i was like okay but then i was like hey i'm from delhi university i don't i have no touch with iisc so this is no longer an alumni group for me so let's figure this figure that out uh, but anyway so I, I built uh, CSG um, or helped them build CSG in the initial years. And then after a point of time, there are a few things that I realized. One was it was on Facebook. Second, it was very specifically targeted to a specific audience. And I always, I mean, back from PhD itself, by the way, if anybody's listening, make a LinkedIn profile. You have to make a LinkedIn profile while you're at PhD. Uh, we can talk about it. We can chat about it. But don't think LinkedIn is outside. Have a photograph also um, and not like some. There are people who put gods and goddesses on their profile photographs. Please don't do that. That's not worth it. Um, so LinkedIn to me was the biggest way to do actual professional advice. And so I kept wondering how I can make the LinkedIn group go further because I had made the LinkedIn group back then itself in 2016. But over time, because I was in consulting and finance and I didn't get a lot of time, I wasn't able to really put time on it. Last, well, not last year, end of 2019, I realized now I'm uh, within pharma and pharma has slightly, I mean, it has, I mean, I, ultimately work-life balance depends on you. So if you are somebody who wants to like, you know, but anyway, I think I had a better work-life balance and I started uh, really investing time on building out uh, the LinkedIn group that I had built. And that's when I realized that one of the biggest things that I want to do is to get people who can give advice. And that's the most important thing about grad grade is that the percentage of people, the number of people that there are in there uh, actually can give advice. There are a lot of people who actually have made the transition from PhD either into assistant professorship or into jobs outside academia. Now, I, 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 I realized I should have started with this. Now I should define what grad grid is. Grad grid is a community of PhDs, uh, both STEM, which means science, technology, engineering, medicine, and math, uh, and outside STEM, so humanities and social sciences. So it is. it started off specifically for PhDs. Right now, it's actually opened up and there are a lot of master students there as well. But basically, it's a community to support career networking. And I I, uh, I have started to realize people don't like the word networking. So let's replace it with the word connecting. It's a place where you can connect with other people who are either PhDs or masters, maybe within your subject, outside your subject. The three most important people, important questions that people ask when figuring out their career is what can I do? Who can I talk to? And how can I apply? The what can I do will come after who can I talk to in my mind. And this is the answer or, or our effort to answer who can I talk to. So if you have a whole bunch of people who have already done that journey, can you reach out to them and can you talk to them? Uh, we can get into some other discussions ever of how you should reach out. But basically, that's what GradGrid is. It currently has about 8,000 members all across the world. Um, and uh, we have started doing a few things here and there. So we are on Twitter. We post jobs. There are a lot of people posting jobs from multiple places. There are a lot of good content uh, developers who have found that space to share their content, you know, including you, Pawan. 
and and your group um and so essentially it's a platform where people can share information and career advice and networking advice and therefore often because career isn't isn't outside of your life life advice right like how do you manage uh you know living uh, in two separate cities when your you know significant other is in a separate city and stuff like that um so that's what grad grid is and i'm glad that it picked up last year because we started off uh end of 2019 we had about 750 800 members right uh today we have about 7800 members so that's a huge huge growth in one year and so now uh the joke that we have internally among the few people that i i get help to run this is that you know uh and i must say that there are some amazing people here so there is anupam who is currently just starting his uh university of michigan assistant professorship uh there is pooja who is in a who, biotech uh there is sadaf who is in a biotech in boston there is vira who's uh who's uh in france working for a medical writing job and then there is anupam's wife and my classmate uh anupam and i actually met in stevens so that's how i know him for for the last few years so ushati she works for um idt which is a which is a, a diagnostic let's call it a diagnostic and gene de- manufacturing companies and all of them are are helping out here and there this is completely um voluntary there is an we and we we are not getting paid for this we are not uh we haven't registered ourselves yet um it might happen at some point but we uh, we don't know whether it's going to be as a non-profit or a profit we have no idea about that yet uh but it's purely voluntary and people are doing and anyway one of them told me so now we have uh, an audience so now we have to start the music because you know janta aake khadi hui hai so now you have to say, so now we are building products uh one of the products is you know uh, 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 uh we have only done one and we want to do more but uh something called phd paths where people come and talk about their journey but in a very specific way like the way we want to make it different from other other such situations is like we'll give them a template and they will walk through their story and then people would have already asked them the questions and then it's an interactive uh discussion uh we are also trying to do a regular event on clubhouse and then there are here and there things like that but right now with covid i think uh, and especially with the amount of pressure on india on covid i'm getting distracted so there is not not a lot of stuff happening but anyway that's great great yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for I you know uh, sharing and building this such platform. I think I agree on the LinkedIn not much exists. Uh yeah, so I have kind of realized and we started I stem care especially for Asian communities like people in US definitely know a lot of exposure that you said but back I think US population is just maybe 5% of the total world population. Yeah, if you take US Europe, but the rest of the population China, Asia, Middle East, I mean not at all connected to. So what we are trying to do here is trying to get this information like your career, you come from that background and maybe 1.5 billion people if even 10 people get interested in such careers, that's a success, right? Absolutely. So, <laughs> absolutely. So Yeah. No, absolutely. So, It's people don't understand this, but like I have uh sorry to interrupt you, Pavan, but I I I spoke to a PhD almost every week when I graduated. And I calculated that when I was actually starting to rebuild or restart grad grid, I made a blog and I did I ran a survey uh, which I'm running again this year as well. And so last year we had about 300 survey respondents. This year so far we have had 600. So I want to reach 1000 and then we'll start analyzing the data. But I calculated how many people I I've, I've spoken to and I've spoken to at least about 250 to 300 PhDs one on one in the last 5 years. And I I have quite a few stories where people have said and I feel good. So this is not necessarily me trying to boast, but I feel good that they have said like if you didn't say this, then I would have never know. 
and that's what this conversation is about so like yes hitting those 10 people like i'm so glad that you're doing this and and i'm really really happy that i was able to come here and share like my long answers with you guys. yes so i have a last question about uh, related to this so what we have been talking is more of a reverse career engineering where like person have postdoc phd and can redefine their career path uh-huh. but what about people who are just bachelor or masters uh-huh. and they want to craft forward journey right so what would be your maybe five top five advice for bachelor master people to kind of if they want to move in your kind of career uh, how should they approach how should they plan what should they kind of kind of structure or strategize their journey yeah um the very first thing is self reflection and this is not necessarily reverse engineering or forward engineering at any point of time whether you're 20 or 40 you need to stop sit back and self analyze if you do that early uh it's good uh and those things will change so then the second thing is flexibility so i'll i'll i'll, I'll t- i mean i don't have five things i'm just generally saying the things that are coming to mind so self analysis flexibility um discovery i think is another one so let's let's talk about these three and then we can think if there are other two right self analysis is what you might like at 20 might change from what you're liking at 30 and might change from what you're liking at 40 but what you like at 20 needs to be important uh, far too long and this this will this answer will depend on where you are in the globe uh while in india when i was growing up and when we were growing up uh doing something such as you know mass communications wasn't a big big thing right now it's all about mass communications because communication has become such an important tool in the day of twitter and in the day of politics and media that we currently see that people having medical writing skills scientific communication skills is super important uh is writing something that you like so right make start questioning yourself what are the things that you do like that you absolutely enjoy doing and the way to know this is um when does time fly for you what are the things that you don't recall you did while you were doing it and then suddenly you realize oh my god 4 hours have passed and i've been doing this and if that is something uh ask that in your life and ask that during your undergrad right so what are the subjects that you were studying that you always loved studying so that's important because then you know that this is something that you intrinsically like then start talking to people uh, which is the discovery phase which is what is out there so i like writing but i don't really like biology um but i like writing so what should i write about and i'm getting a bsc chemistry degree so what should i write about right so then there are things that people will start telling you so how do you find those people are through things like stem care through things like grad grid things like stem peers a lot of these places you will find people with interesting background so ask those questions and don't feel bad that somebody is going to say this is a dumb question so do not so that's what i mean by discovery do not forget to ask dumb questions right and then comes flexibility so you thought at 20 you wanted to do something you focused on that started doing it either because you never got a job application or because you did it and realized oh man i don't really want to do this you realized this was not the right idea be flexible to forgive yourself that oh this was not a right idea this is not for me stop start again and that is fine because if you keep doing something that you absolutely do not enjoy then after a point of time you realize oh man i've wasted time so rather than wasting that time be flexible forgive yourself or whatever you know whoever gave you the advice to do something stop at that point in in investment it is called sunk cost you have already spent that time you're not going to get that time back but you got some experience out of it use that experience and move forward now none of this is very actionable pavan i know that you're like asking like what what is so in terms of actionable i'll go back and say uh in bachelors any opportunity you get to meet people meaning if you are, if you can volunteer for clubs and societies within your undergraduate college to organize something to organize an event 
to go take part in a competition make a team and go take part in a a, a science presentation competition go take part in an idea challenge any opportunity that you get where you go meet people is basically one way to figure out oh this thing also exists so that's one actionable thing to do apply for scholarships left right and center you may not get them you might even think i don't qualify for them that doesn't stop you from applying the re- the reason why i'm saying this is when you apply that process of applying makes you realize what documents you need what do you need to do something so you may not get get it that year but you might get it next year so apply for random scholarships and i applied for scholarships in the us not knowing and this is just me like i was super crazy on that front i once sent an email and this is a positive story i read a book i loved it so much in undergraduate it was called maitland and jones the two authors uh uh an organic chemistry and i wrote the book and i was like i love your books i mean i didn't write the book sorry i read the book from the library i was like i love this book so much is it possible that i can get uh uh a copy of the workbook from you the author replied and sent me a signed copy of the workbook wow okay and it was <laughs> random who some random guy in delhi university is emailing some professor i forget where he was i think michigan state or somewhere and he didn't have to do it but i sent him and he was like yes absolutely thank you and he sent it for free <laughs> right and yeah. the, the, and i have also the flip side of it is i have when i was applying for you know i thought i wanted to do an internship in the us for whatever reason i thought okay let's try it so i applied for about 40 places i got two replies right and one of them didn't i mean both of them were positive but neither of them worked out because there was some issue with my delhi university mark sheet as usual in india but uh 38 people did not reply very quickly that's a, i mean 2 out of 40 is what 5% 2.4 right so 95% failure so you will not get a reply <laughs> that's fine but there is nothing stopping you from sending the email there is nothing stopping you from reaching out right that's what i i i cannot stress this enough don't don't self select yourself out because you think people might like people may not reply and i feel bad if they don't reply yeah you will feel bad but that will make sure that you get like very accustomed to rejection i mean <laughs> right That's and true. especially if you are applying for phd and trying to get into phd it's better to acclimatize yourself yeah. with failures early on yeah but yeah i mean this has been amazing we are going to end our conversation with rapid fire oh <laughs> Really? Yeah. <laughs> you have rapid fire. <laughs> okay. Um so no thinking quick answers. What do you prefer? Jalmuri or Golgappa? Jalmuri. Make it every day. Ashiki Chakravarti or Metallica? Metallica. Wow, you are offending a lot of Bengalis here. <laughs> oh, well, um LinkedIn or Twitter? LinkedIn. <laughs> Chemistry or consulting? Ooh. <laughs> that's a tough one. That is that is a tough one. I'll actually Or maybe choose. maybe Sorry, chemistry but... consulting. All right. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a tough one because I've always I've always maintained both. I'm not kidding. Um every every job I've had, I've drawn the one steroid structure was uh, so my PhD I did a, I discovered a few chemical structures from natural products. One of them was a steroid structure and I love drawing steroids. So it has now become a thing where like I'll draw the entire stereochemical steroid structure and put it up on my desk. <laughs> so so that's a tough one to answer. I'm a nerd, I'm a chemistry nerd, but I love the basics of consulting. I love the strategy aspect of thinking and and basically knowing how to think and breaking down a problem into separate buckets. So it's a tough question, but I might just say 5149 consulting over chemistry. <laughs> wow, okay. And the last one. Um Durga Puja in Calcutta or 
uh, New Year's Eve in Manhattan. No question. No questions. No questions. Durga Puja in Calcutta. I've I've missed out on it a lot. Um, in fact, I grew up in a family where my my dad didn't necessarily uh, let us stay super late during Durga Puja as well, right? But uh, yeah, I miss Durga Puja. Uh, then people and by the way, I've had friends who have gone back to India just because of that. And here I am right now in the US. So then people will ask then why why do you say Durga Puja? Because I miss it a lot. If I miss New York uh in New in New Year's I I may not miss it. But I miss Durga Puja a lot. So for sure. Yeah. Excellent. You yeah, you you've been really really enjoyable to talk yeah. to. We we really had amazing time. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm gl- sorry if I went long for some of the answers. No, absolutely no, problem. no worries. That, that's Yeah, thank you. With that, I think we'll wrap. So, thank you so much, uh, Farag, for kind of giving your time on weekends and talking with us, sharing your journey. I mean, I'm sure the listener will have a lot of questions from you. So, probably they may reach out to you on LinkedIn or Absolutely. Twitter. Absolutely. We'll put your uh, all the detail in the link of the video uh, so that they can reach out to you. So, Sounds with good. that, we will uh, wrap it here and have a great weekend. Great you too. Ahead. Thanks. This was pl- this was really good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Bye.